Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, everybody. And welcome to another episode of uh, Intercultural Conversations. And uh, today, before I start the episode, I would like for the reference of people who are non-Indian who will be joining or will be watching this video uh, later on, that I will be using the term Adivasi during the interview, during the course of this interview. And Adivasi means a person who is from the indigenous community in India. So um, if, um, if you're going to be watching this later on and are confused, uh, that's what Adivasi means. And um, I think growing up, for me, the term Adivasi or an Adivasi person um, meant a person who lives in the forest, right? And it often didn't go beyond that, unfortunately. And my only interaction that I had with an uh, uh, indigenous person from India was when I would go for a walk in the national park, where that's very close to where I grew up. Um, that, that, that's the time when I had kind of an interaction with an Adivasi person or the community not realizing that I'm actually living on legally encroached forest land, right? And uh, I think we didn't have that much information then or didn't have that much of um, exposure then to or the maturity to understand that I was actually living in a land that was rightfully the home of these people who were now kind of pushed to the outskirts of the forest almost. And um, now that I look back as an interculturalist, I, I, I understand the importance of knowing the stories of the people from indigenous communities, knowing the stories of people whose stories are not generally told or heard. And uh, especially with the Adivasi community in India, there have been such amazing women like uh, Dayamani Barla, there have been women like um, Kuni Sikaka. These are women who actually, you know, fought against governments and capitalistic organizations. And we don't hear about them much, right? We don't hear about these stories much because we're just so engrossed in our lives. So today, I hope that through this conversation, we are able to hear from the, uh, from a person from the community, hear their stories, hear their experience, and hear about the experiences and the challenges that the community face, wherein we could have possibly not otherwise heard. And hopefully with this, we not only um, understand or learn, but also see what kind of action that we as people from privileged positions can take. Uh, because it, in a country like India, which has such a diverse culture, there are so many cultures, it's very multicultural, it, it, it's very easy for some voices to get lost in the voices of communities that are more, either more dominant or more privileged. So yes, that's going to be our conversation for today. And I'm joined by the wonderful Evangelina Kulu. Evangelina Kulu is an Adivasi activist herself, and she belongs to the tribes in uh, Odisha, which she will speak about when she's joined by us, she, when she joins us. And uh, she is a communication specialist, and she uses that skill to kind of empower the Adivasi youth to, in, in mobile journalism. And she's also a graduate from NIFT. For people who don't know, NIFT is one of the leading uh, fashion institutes in India. And uh, today she's going to join us and share with us her experiences and her part of the story. So I'm just going to add her quickly. Give me a second, please. Hello. Hi, Tata. Johar. Johar. Johar Evangelina. How are you doing? I'm doing good. So good to see you finally. Yes. And thank you. Thank you for taking the time to do this. And thank you for gracing 
the episode of intercultural conversations and if i've missed anything out of the you know from the introduction for you please please go ahead and um kind of share if i've missed out anything yeah sure uh, so um, as pratha was talking as she was giving my introduction i belong to uh, three communities uh, in india and i'm originally from uh, chota nagpur plateau which is uh, uh the southern part of odisha uh, sorry the northern part of odisha uh, parts of uh, chatisgarh northern parts of chatisgarh and southern part of jharkhand so okay. uh, this, yeah so and uh, how i come from three tribes is uh, my father is uh, from khadia community and my mother is uh, from munda and urao community so that's how i am here uh, okay. with all these three com- all these three cultures where i get to see so much i get to learn so much and yes. uh, thank you for inviting me of course of course and you know that you say that you come from a such a rich cultural background in a sense you belong to three tribes and i'm sure it was an amazing experience to you in a sense growing up you know in that kind of a environment so that's what i wanted to actually start off with you know how was your experience growing up as an indigenous person and how was that experience for you of course and you can shed light on the community as well communities as well and how was that experience you think different from what a non indigenous person living in the same environment kind of as you are living in how how do you think those experiences are different uh yeah so uh, as uh, you were telling in the beginning uh, about uh, your experience when you went to the nearby forest and then how you had an encounter with uh, uh, the communities there um i also have a similar experience even though i belong to the community uh i did not live on my ancestral land whereas i lived on someone else's ancestral land and uh, there um, also when you go as a migrant you are thinking more about uh, your well-being more about the family's well-being so that's how it happened that uh, uh, we were invis- invisibilized to um, the communities around us uh, since it was more about sustaining it was more about living your life but uh, uh, at the same time we were not really taught about uh, the ancestral land where we go to so uh, my where i grew up uh, there i did not have any kind of exposure like this uh, and i grew up like any other uh, non indigenous person i would say okay. and, <laughs> and then uh, the first time uh, when i came across my identity was uh, uh, in my standard 9th and that's when um, uh the school sent a form to fill up about your caste and uh, there were these four options like general category then um, uh, obc sc sc and then i was since we, uh, we lived in a gated community it was a township so people would not talk much about these things because everything was so secured and everything was you know like um, they had they had confined houses so there were no uh conflicts about land or anything right so it was it was more of a homogeneous society where people came from different parts of india so uh, in my standard line that was my first encounter uh, with that uh, <laughs> with that form which i had to fill up and uh, uh, that's when i got to know okay we belong to scheduled tribe and that's when uh, mm. <laughs> it was a, it was a i don't know how that felt for you was was it <laughs> Uh, eye opening was it inspiring did it kind of inspire you to then find out more about your mm. ancestors and your community oh not at all uh, since mm. uh, when you are in your standard 9th you're pretty young so um, oh. the only thing you care about is like you know you go you going to the school and you know what you're doing all your day how you're engaged with different activities so uh, and living in an indigenous uh, living in a in a homogeneous society was not not much of a big deal out there so uh, hmm. it was just like a form was filled and it was sent out and uh, that was one time uh, one thing which struck me during that time was uh, uh, how um, my i was there was a bit of disappointment that disappointment that how parents also do not talk about uh, uh, their identity and you know being a scheduled tribe 
and uh, it was not that open people were not people would not discuss about their uh, uh, community as much with as much bigger as you know you would see uh, from in, in different communities like you know non indigenous communities so there was not right. much of pride so that that was the first time when i felt that okay mm-hmm. why why is it that you know they would not talk about this so openly and you know why why so much of hesitation so that was the first time and then uh, later um, in my college days also uh, since i came from a privileged section where uh, i was confident and you know the way i was taught at my school my schooling and everything uh it, it did not make me feel as much as uh, how other uh, people from the community in the college right. would uh, have to face because they did not have that confidence they were, they came from rural background so uh, it did not affect me much but it was much later in my life when uh, i was working with different organizations and you know there would be times when people would speak up something about the caste and uh, that's when my mouth <laughs> opened and you know i spoke up something and uh, and then and then from then onwards the journey towards going back to my root started mm-hmm. yeah so and okay, you, you, uh, you know, yeah yes please yeah. uh so uh, this this was something uh, uh, what happened externally and uh, mm-hmm. internally if you ask me then uh, you know if I, when i was surrounded with my relatives who were from different communities uh then uh, i would start to see these differences that uh, uh how uh, my mother who is from uh, urao and uh, uh, munda background so how uh, these communities are different you know like that's when mm-hmm. you would see in your relatives that okay how the communities are slightly different and uh, it also showed you uh, like you would start noticing these subtle differences like okay my paternal grandfather has a, a very different outlook and my maternal has a very different outlook and then you know that's when i started comparing as well so that's yes. how <laughs> because each tribe has its own culture too so it's yeah. it, we we have a very uh, superficial idea that the adivasi community is just a, you know a homogeneous community and that is a very outsider's perspective and you could also say an uninformed perspective too mm-hmm. but there is yeah. clearly there are cultures within the tribes as well that are different as well so it's just so interesting to me that you had you 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 kind of had a non indigenous perspective to your own community too because like you said you kind of had uh, the privileges that they may not have grown up with in a sense and but then you you did get into activism and then you did realize that there is clearly a divide there is clearly you know the success of this country is not really reaching the grassroots like what we see in the news you know about india being close to being one of the richest country culturally very abundant etc but those those riches are not reaching to the grassroots where many of the adivasi communities are actually so in your journey with the adi you know with the activism did you like i wanted to get your kind your perspective on what is the you know condition of the adivasi community right now in india and what are the challenges that they face because we also hear in the news if you're looking at the right platform that there's a lot of you know encroachment happening a lot of deforestation happening and this is ideally the homes of these communities and of course it comes with a lot of challenges if you are faced by you know huge government organizations or huge capitalistic organizations or these big extraction companies that have lobbies in the government as well so i would like to get your perspective since you've been on ground what is it right now in modern india to be a part of the adivasi community and what are the challenges they face okay so here also i'll give you uh, uh like um how things have been working on uh, on ground uh, like people like adivasis who live uh, in forest fringes and uh, adivasis who live in um, uh, urban areas so uh, it's like mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. things have been uh, double sword uh when it comes to uh, forest dwelling communities uh, they have been living with uh, so much of fear about uh, land and en- land encroachment and every day like since i 
uh, am looking into uh, the social media and communications i get to hear all these news about uh, adivasis from different parts of india and uh, that's when you know that uh, people who are uh, from the forest dwelling communities uh, they have um, there's not even a single day that i do not hear news about encroachments to be very honest so uh, uh, communities living in um, the uh, communities living in the forest they are always under under this tremendous pressure that you know since they are uh, living in a natural resource uh, rich land they yeah. are uh, always under scrutiny they are always under so much of pressure uh, whereas uh, an adivasi who is uh, living let's say somewhere in uh, a town or a city uh, they have to also face so much of discrimination which people around them they do not know about adivasis uh, so they always have to um, you know be very careful especially with their food habits and uh, uh, since um, our schooling systems never taught us about adivasi so people are like far away and also bollywood to blame that how they have been uh, stigmatizing adivasis so people have a completely wrong notion about what adivasis exactly are so yeah. um, that's that's what happens in uh, uh, cities and towns in urban spaces that uh, uh, adivasis have to always be you know very thoughtful about uh, very careful and cautious about how they are expressing themselves and you know what part of being them themselves is. yeah and being yeah. themselves so, with caution and that's a yeah, tremendous absolutely. pressure to live with that i yeah. can't be the way i am without caution or without thinking twice is something that is it can be an outside concept for me for sure coming from mm-hmm. privilege yes yeah so so yeah there you go like you know double sword mm-hmm. double sword yes double edged sword yeah that's what i would say right yes and i think then it becomes also a very shared responsibility in a sense that people who don't belong to the non indigenous communities should go out there and at least inform themselves so there may not be chances where you know they are able to interact with a person from the community because there is such a divide or there's such a distance that or i don't know maybe there is not as much integration as well that that another thing that i that that's another doubt i have right uh, what does integration even mean does a person from the indigenous community want to necessarily get integrated in what we kind for example in the urban areas right is mm-hmm. there a need for integration from the communities end or it's just you know protecting their own um their own culture their own their own lands and their own homes so that that kind of a dilemma for me too and uh, i think then it becomes then the responsibility also of the non indigenous people to inform themselves about you know the situations and the conditions of uh, of people who are now kind of pushed to the fringes of society and sometimes even willingly so i i also wanted to kind of understand from you then you know who who is your role model at the moment right so who who is your role model that inspires you to do the work that you're doing and there is clearly something that pushed you right in it, so that more voices are heard from your community so is it because there was a role model or is it just you know pure personal will that you decided to do this uh well uh, by looking at the situation of you know how things are in our country uh in yeah. relation to adivasis um uh, it's it's difficult to you know take a neutral state it's difficult to completely ignore you know whatever is happening around so um uh, i so like you know the kind of comfort i come from uh i i could easily go back i could easily shut my ears but uh, it's it's just not possible you know once you're aware and once you're already on that path of um, you know un- uncovering unveiling uh then you know like you know you 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 just there you you there's no looking back from there <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's um it's uh, it's 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 difficult but uh, uh the moment uh, you are with the communities uh the moment you are you know visiting uh, your relatives or you're visiting uh, um other communities uh, for instance i was uh, um i was i was born and raised in south odisha 
uh, and the ancestral land which I was talking about, it belongs to uh, uh, the community called Dongria Kond over there. So okay. this is yeah. So and uh, they are one of the communities who are also called uh, uh, PVTGs, which is uh, particularly vulnerable tribal groups. Uh, okay. And uh, that also means that uh, they have uh, uh, they have managed to. Uh, uh, not leave everything behind like other communities. So hmm. they still live uh, uh, with their community. They still practice uh, uh, their um, traditional ways of living. So um, uh, these people, uh, I, I often get to visit them. And uh, what I have uh, been, uh, what I have experienced with them is uh, um, the kind of uh, uh, resistance they put up. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, keeping these uh, mining lobbies away. And uh, there was also one of the news that how they won a case against Vedanta in Supreme Court. Yes. So, yeah, yes. so Vedanta is this mining company and they wanted to mine bauxite there. Uh, right. And, uh, you know, and, and since I come from both the sides, like I was on the other side also when uh, since I went there, I migrated there. I um, uh, like I was... I, I'm partly responsible for, uh, you know, like I have got all the comfort from um, uh, from their land. So as an encroacher, so I'm I've been on that side, and you know, at the same time, I since uh, I I I visit them and I have been in their movements. I've been a part of their movements. So um, when I when I when I get to know about these kind of uh, stories that you know how they put up the resistance. It's yeah. just so beautiful. Like, you know, that's when uh, you know that, you know, like it, everything, like, you know, all the hardships which I'm bearing of unveiling, of unlearning, it's it's all mm -hmm. worth it. Like, you know, when I go there and I get to hear the stories of uh, uh, how they put up against uh, the uh, policemen who come from the companies or uh, the companies themselves. So, uh, my God, like, you know, that's, that's like, I have never felt so inspired uh, than before, like, you know, since um, uh, there's such wonderful stories out there. And I'm sure, like, uh, this is uh, also the story of uh, other communities who have been putting up with that resistance. So I would say, like, yeah, you know, yeah. these people are just so amazing, like... Um, yeah, uh, and, and entire, and, entire yeah. community becomes your role model. So you <laughs> exactly. You just get them and you're just inspired. So you, there's not yeah. one person, but the entire community then can can motivate you to then speak up and have your voice, find your voice, and then kind of propagate that change in the world. Yeah, right? yeah. And just to give people context of how this must feel for the people of the indigenous community, imagine you're in your apartment building and the police just suddenly enters into your house and is telling you that you have to leave. Right? So yeah. just, just contextualizing that in our everyday life, that if tomorrow, today, right now, if the police comes knocking and says, now, chalo, go, you can't. Because some, some richer person wants to live in this house mm -hmm. or wants something out of this house. So now you have to leave. Right? And what, what does being rich even mean? It's just so subjective in that way as well. But just to contextualize it for people, that's how it feels, mostly for indigenous communities as well. And... I, I was just wondering how, how do you think, you know, non-indigenous people can be allies to people from the indigenous community or Adivasi communities and, you know, specifically speaking in an Indian context as well. How do you think that we can be allies? Oh, so um, uh, it's, it's pretty easy, actually, <laughs> but it could not be for some people as well. <laughs> Why is it taking so long then, Evangelina? Seriously, <laughs> if it was easy, I wish it would have happened long, long back. But please inspire us. Uh, so um, uh, many of the movements, as you see, uh, uh, it's uh, it's not just on Adivasi people, the onus of you know uh, saving the ancestral land or uh, saving the forest. Uh, it's uh, the onus is on every one of us, uh, be, it an, be it an indigenous or non-indigenous. And uh, Adivasis definitely need allies because uh, this fight otherwise is not possible. Uh, the resistance is not possible. We are uh, just 8.4% um, uh, of India's population and uh, such a small number, you know, out of <laughs> like uh, 
such a big population in the country so it's it's not possible mm-hmm. for just a few of us to you know um, uh, have this battle going on so uh, allies definitely we we need allies who will be supporting us and uh, the most important part of being a, a good ally is uh, uh, to to be to be uh, to be there to support but uh, the major decisions uh, which would be which should be taken should be taken by uh, the indigenous communities and right. um, yeah and uh, also uh, basically like you know as easy it is that you know passing the mic and <laughs> uh, and speaking less <laughs> yes it's and also yeah. and creating space yes exactly sure. creating spaces and also uh, being enablers because uh, since there has been so much of suppression uh, for you know generations that uh, adivasis have not been able to speak up like you know you mostly if you notice them in rural areas or or amongst you know others also uh, they uh, they are um, they are shy they they do not they do not mingle as easily and uh, it takes time for them to open up uh, and sometimes they do not even open up i see like you know they would just want to be uh, keeping quiet but this is not the time to keep quiet especially when uh, uh, things are going so rough so um, uh, we need allies who could uh, be good enablers who would um, give us space and at the same time also uh, uh, ask us several questions and you know like create a comfortable space where uh, adivasis can speak up yes because yeah. only when we hear directly from because most of the problems i think people who have the mic <laughs> they assume most of the problems without even you know giving a chance for the person to speak or giving the chance for the members of the community to speak and we don't need to speak for anyone we just need to create that space that we've received or inherited by privilege right okay? absolutely and and what do you think then that means because you know like you said now we 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 kind of have um platforms in a sense and you know you are doing your work too where in your kind of empowering the youth uh adivasi youth to and training them in mobile journalism so you know we have access to all of these platforms we have access to technology and in this time and space after having access to so much what do you think holds in the future for the adivasi community firstly and secondly what especially holds for the future of the adivasi youth because one of our biggest assets in this country apparently is the youth of the country so also you know with respect to the adivasi youth and what holds for them in their future oh from uh, from what i've been surrounded with uh, i can see a lot of hope around me that people are doing so yeah. much and uh, social media is also partly responsible that uh, people have been so aware and uh, people have been able to speak up especially when uh, mainstream media is so biased in uh, reporting yeah. news so uh, this is one of the spaces i feel that uh, people can come up people can um, speak their hearts out and you know make people aware uh, especially when uh, other people are also saturated <laughs> with you know whatever is happening so people are yeah. looking for things and how a person eventually uh evolves as well so a person is not supposed to remain the same so eventually when they also look for different avenues like this is great that you know if today i'm bored with something then tomorrow i can also switch to something else so that's how i see like you know how people like uh, as i am on the path of you know unveiling and also learning more people are also on the same path so uh, i have i have the hope that uh, uh people will choose the right thing and especially mm-hmm. in the time when uh, we all face the climate crisis right in our faces uh people people want to people are looking for solutions people are looking for uh, hope and people are wanting to do more so um, adivasi youth also i see that you know they are no less and uh, mm-hmm. uh, and and i'm i'm just hopeful about everyone uh, not just adivasi youth but also other people since we have all been the victims of climate change yeah. and yeah <laughs> yeah and that's so wonderful that you say that because i think hope hope being hopeful can be a very uh, a powerful thing it can be a very powerful thing and when you hope for good to happen <laughs> then that is the best for sure 
and i do see you know your stories and i see these little indigenous children actually knowing so much because i was seeing one of your stories when you were on ground and you know there was this little girl she was showing you around the field if i'm not wrong and they're just so <laughs> aware and they're just so integrated in their surroundings it's so beautiful to watch and then i think through the power of social media then i also have access to that right maybe i would never have had access to that kind of imagery living True. you know in urban metro city but thank you thank you for doing the work that you do and kind of sharing the stories as well so am i audible i think i lost you there for a second but oh yeah 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 you yeah. are now i think i lost you in between yeah yeah and i usually actually evangelina i i i end my interviews with this question because like you said there is hope there is hope for good change and i think in the past 2 years that has been my word because things have to change <laughs> for sure for us to now move into a new world so firstly if you had to change something you know either within yourself or outside of yourself what would you change and and why oh uh, well if we talk about change and you know if, if so if i i could have changed something then uh, i would i would want to uh, i would want my community to have uh, more forest land uh, i would want my community to uh, 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 to eat uh, more of those foods which my ancestors used to eat so since the forest is shrinking um there's uh, the the food uh, uh, the wild food which um, adivasis forage in the forest it's it's becoming even less and less so uh, uh, i would i would want more abundance for them i would mo- I want more abundance uh, in terms of food i would want more abundance in terms of uh, clean water so and i would want more abundance in terms of uh, uh, biodiversity so that that's something which i would want for my community if you ask me mm-hmm. yeah. sure and all of these all of these things seem like they should have never in the first place been taken away or not been abundant it is that we've turned it into a uh, an environment such that now we are craving for that abundance for our people and um, I, i hope i hope that happens and i'm sure with with people like you who are putting stories out there who are on ground with the activism who are on ground with the people uh, i'm sure that change uh, and my personal utopia and your personal utopia is going to materialize for sure <laughs> so evangelina thank you so much thank you so much for sharing your story thank you so much for sharing uh, about your community as well and i'm sure that people have learned something today for sure because i know i have and hopefully they've also learned about what they can do in order to be allies right so before you go uh, could you also please teach us another word so i learned johar from you which i believe is hello from which um, which tribe says johar if i may oh, ask so uh, this is uh, this is a very common greeting which uh, you would find uh, here in my region and also um, in most of the central parts of india uh, this is okay. one of the common greetings yeah right is there anything else that you could teach us possibly so that we you know it's it's part of our memory and we have one word that we take away from you mm-hmm. uh well uh, in that case oh, if you ask me then i think i'll be more clear <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh for example how would you how would you say bye or i hope to see you again oh so okay so i can teach you um, uh, this word uh, in mundari uh, okay. and uh, yeah and it's called uh, um, uh, for good night it's called hedem uh, dudum hedem dudum yeah hedem dudum is good night in mundari hedem <laughs> dudum wow yeah. that sounds beautiful <laughs> that sounds beautiful thank you so much thank you so much for sharing that and before you go would you like to share where people can find you or any other information where they can follow or any of your work that they can see oh so um uh, we have this organization called adivasi lives matter uh, where i'm working as a social media and communications manager so there uh, 
we try to bring as many as many stories as possible from uh, the indigenous communities uh from the states where we work so uh, our endeavor is to do as much as possible uh to bring as many stories as possible which is uh told by the indigenous communities themselves and not by anyone else and uh, similarly like um, how people have this stigma so uh let the stigma get you know removed from people's lives and they start uh, respecting and they start giving um, uh, more importance to how uh, adivasis are and uh, what adivasis do for uh, uh, for the planet in general since we have right. been uh, preserving 80% of the biodiversity of the world by just being 5% of population <laughs> so this is what so, i would want that for more impact. and more people to learn some yeah <laughs> okay. yes okay thank you thank you so much evangelina and i hope to actually meet you someday hopefully we are in the same city and yes. we get to see each other and thank you so much everybody who joined in the video will also be available after i finish the live and have a great great evening Thank you thank you Prata thank, thank you, you so much. bye <laughs> bye bye